Well, as people uh, move in, I just want to uh, let everybody uh, know that uh, you're being broadcast live on, uh, on Facebook Live right now. It's kind of a bizarre experience to be watching yourself on your phone as you're speaking, except there is a five second delay. Um, I think that's in case Jorge says anything totally outrageous and we just have to cut him off, you know, <laughs> if he goes rogue at any point. Uh, welcome to the Wilson Center again. Um, it's lovely to see uh, uh, all of you here. Um, this is, of course, part of our series of events covering the uh, 2018 uh, Mexican elections. Um, we're delighted to have with us Jorge Buendia, who is the director of Buendia uh, and Laredo. You have his uh, biography on the back. Um, I will not read any of that, but I will say he's a pretty cool guy. Um, and uh, he is obviously one of the most respected pollsters in Mexico. So it's a great privilege to have him here with us today. Um, and uh, this is an opportunity for us to uh, sort of get an inside uh, look at the polling numbers as they're coming through in Mexico. Um, Jorge is extremely knowledgeable about uh, Mexican politics in general, so he's agreed to leave around 25 minutes for the Q&A uh, at the end. So uh, think about your questions um, and think about how you can become Facebook famous um, uh, after he has finished his presentation. Um, Jorge, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I know you, are, you have a, a, an excellent detailed presentation here, and so uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you to the Wilts Center for the invitation. I think I'm going to be standing up because uh, I'm used to do that. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, perfect. Yeah, th there's no. I just want to make sure that I know how this works. Um, just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking, uh, we're going to look at uh, one of the main drivers behind electoral preference in Mexico, which is retrospective evaluations. Then we are going to look at how Mexicans perceive political parties and candidates. And then we're going to close the presentation with a discussion, I think, of how polarized is Mexico. I know you guys are now more or less used to polarization issues here in the US, and I want to put in context how polarized is Mexico right now. So to start, retrospective evaluation. This is a consumer confidence index produced by INEGI. You can see here, uh, Jenny, Oh, it doesn't work that. In January 2017, we have the famous gasolinazo. You can see how huge was the dip that the Consumer Confidence Index took. And nowadays, it's more or less in the similar to previous levels. I mean, so what does, what does this mean it, is that in terms of public opinion, it seems that the impact of gasolinazo has more or less um, been erased because now the index is around 88 uh, points and it was uh, one year before 89, 85. So the impact of gasolinazo has been eroded, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't, it didn't have a clear political impact and I'm going to show you some other numbers. This is a direction of the country. You can see that uh, we are right now in a very pessimistic mood. We have about 64% of Mexicans that think that the country is in going in the wrong direction. This is not something that happened all the uh, Peña Nieto's government. You can see that at the beginning of his term, and probably this is part of the famous honeymoon that all politicians enjoy during the first months in office, but people in Mexico were quite optimistic when he came to power, 44% had a positive view of the direction of the country. Nowadays, that percentage is 20 points lower. And as I was saying, you can see this huge gap between the red and the blue numbers, which is the gap between positive and negative opinions. Actually, this is quite similar to what's going in the US, where you have, and I don't know if you've seen in Twitter or something like that, that they, uh, they draw an image of a crocodile, like opening its mouth, that, that's more or less the same image there. Um, approval rating follows more or less the same trend. 
we now have in our latest numbers 38% approval for the president. But I must emphasize one thing. This is mostly weak approval. We are not talking about 30% of Mexicans that strongly approve the way the president is doing his job, but rather that this approval is weak or you can even leaners, people that have a very good opinion, about a good opinion of the president's performance, but they don't feel like approving or disapproving. Uh, you can see that this trend, the negative trend started at the end of 2014 when we have two simultaneous topics going on, a Yotzinapa, when the students disappear, and then the famous Casablanca, the, White, the Mexican White House, where, where accusations of corruption, corruption were made towards the president's family. Since then, the president has had very bad uh, polling numbers, especially if you look, you put these numbers in a comparative perspective, these were numbers that no Mexican president had ever had. So 30% is a very low number for Mexican or international standards. Because of the gasolinazo, you can see that the highest disapproval moment was at the beginning of this year. 74% of Mexicans disapprove of the way President Peña was doing his job. Now that percentage has been reduced. Uh, and approval went from 19% to 30% in our series. There were some other polling numbers like reformas where they had uh, the approval rate at 12%. So the president has bounced back, but still the numbers are very low, similar to what we had one year ago. So just to sum, sum up, uh, the president uh, has very low approval numbers, but it's not as bad as it used to be. And so this is something to keep in mind, because more or less we can say the same thing about the PRI. This is the, uh, the opinion about political parties, percentage of positive opinions. The question is very simple. Do you have a good, a very good, good or bad or very bad opinion about, and we mentioned several of the political parties. You can see how Morena has been growing since February, since 2015. Morena officially was registered as a political party for the 2015 midterm elections. Before that, Morena did not compete at the election. Lopez Obrador was at the PRD. Uh, but you can see that Morena has been growing from 15% of the Mexican population that had a positive opinion about Morena in early 2015 towards 41% right now. It's very clear the party that has uh, the most positive image ahead of the PAN with 32% and the PR, PRI and the PRD with 27. So it's very clear that at, at at least in terms of positioning, Morena is in a better standing than the other parties. I think this is one of the advantages of being an opposition party that has never held a major political office, especially in this context of uh, negative opinions about the establishment, the fact that you have never had power, it's an advantage. Uh, probably you've read in Mexican newspapers that uh, there have been attempts to criticize Morena's performance in office because of some delegaciones that they have in Mexico City, like um, Tlalpan, Cuauhtémoc, or Xochimilco. But uh, the fact is that Mexicans, at this moment, the party that, if you want to put it in these terms, the party that they dislike the least is Morena. Uh, negative opinions, they have increased a little bit, but I just want to call your attention to the negative opinions about the PRI that after Gasolinazo, they went up to 64, 63%. Nowadays, it's not as bad for the PRI, 
but still 57% of Mexicans have a negative opinion about the PRI. And Morena, again, is a party that has the lowest known percentage of negative opinions with 31%. But in general, the party that is best positioned among the Mexican public is Morena. And then we have the PAN, and of course, the incumbent, the PRI, is a party that is most criticized by the Mexican public. Um, this other uh, item confirms what I was saying. The question is, for which party would you never vote? And it is very clear who's on top, no? This is, in top of mind, the party that most Mexicans dislike is the PRI. As I was saying, it's not as bad as it used to be, but it's still really, really bad. And at the bottom, you can see the other parties, but it's not uh, very clear if people dislike most Morena or Pan or whatever. Party ID. Uh, at this stage, a party ID, to some extent, it's more or less similar to electoral preference. And what I want to stress here is the number of independent voters. Independent voters is a residual category. It's people that say that they don't identify with any of the political parties. So just keep that in mind because that number began to grow in 2014. Again, Ayotzinapa and Casablanca were major factors and I want to call your attention to the trends. The number of independents grew, while the number of people who identify with the PRI especially went down. So it seems that the growth of independence was to some extent a reflection of the decline in identification with the PRI. Uh, uh, with this independence group, there are a lot of former priestas. PAN and PRD had a little bit of decline, but it's not as, as steep as in the case of the PRI. The PRI used to have in February 2014, 29% of people who identify with the PRI. Nowadays, this percentage is 15%. So we have an electorate that, to put it in, the, in, in these terms, is the aligned. It doesn't identify with most parties. Now, nowadays, it's 56% per, uh, the number of people in Mexico do, who do not feel close to any major political party. And this is something to keep in mind because this usually brings a lot of volatility during a campaign, and obviously volatility uh, in the polls. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Nate Silver's model, this is a similar model that my business associate Javier Marquez has developed and that he will make it public or will be made public next week or in two more weeks. This is a poll of polls. Here I include all the polls that have been published. Uh, this is what we call, and I, I'm going to focus in another one, uh, what we call the generic ballot, or it's called here in the US the generic ballot. It's party preference. We don't have here candidates. It's just preference for political parties. But there are several important points that I want you to look at. Uh, the left graph, it shows the raw data. We have here uh, item non-response. That, that is the people that did not answer whom they, were, whom they were going to vote for. And in the right hand graph, we have excluded and allocated in a proportional way those people that did not answer that question. But you can see the, this gray area or this gray uh, line. Those are the people that did not answer the question of which party would you vote for if the elections were going to be held today. It's the largest number. So at this moment, we have more people saying that they 
don't know which party they would support in the presidential election, or they don't want to tell us which party they would vote for, but it is the largest number. It's about, uh, in, the, uh, in these uh, statistical models, 20%, uh, largest than Morena, who has 20%, or the PAN, who has 20%. So uh, if you remember Nate Silver's comments before the Trump election, he was cautioning and he was really worried about uh, his forecast because he, he said that uh, his numbers had a good deal of uncertainty because there were a lot of undecideds and people supporting third party candidates. And the number he was giving was 13%. Here we have if you add uh, undecided and support for minor parties, the percentage is around 40%. So that gives you an idea of how uh, uncertain are we at this specific moment. Notwithstanding this, there are several things to keep in mind. As I mentioned, Morena and the PAN in this general generic ballot model are tied in first place. This is without candidates, I want to emphasize <coughs> that. And in second is the PRI with 18%, and the PRD is only 6%. If the PRD loses Mexico City, it's at risk of becoming a very, very minor party in Mexico. And that's a very strong possibility that it will happen. Right now, it's uh, levels very, very low. Look at Morena. Morena now has 20%. And if you look at the trend, this increase has occurred mostly in the past year. We, we see the same trend about the red line is the PRI. We see the same trend that with other numbers that the PRI began to lose support among the Mexican public, but from 2015 towards 2016, the PRI lost votes uh, at the expense of the PAN, or the PAN gained votes at the expense of the PRI. But later on, the loss of support for the PRI has benefited Morena the most. And this is a very important point to keep in mind because the gasolinazo, this steep uh, price increase at the beginning of the year, seems to have benefited the most Morena and not the PAN. Probably one of the reasons of this is that the PAN and the PRD were behind the energy reform, energy constitutional reform. So people probably perceive that in terms of energy issues, the PAN and the PRI were on the same side. So when the fuel price increase came, which for people was a sign of the failure of the energy reform, they just saw that the Lopez Obrador position criticizing energy reform was right, was correct. So Morena benefited the most from that event. So uh, of course, it may be the case that Morena has already begun to be very closely identified with Lopez Obrador and the popularity of Lopez Obrador has already overlapped with Morena and this may also be a reflection of the fact that we are getting very close to the presidential election. Another thing to keep in mind when reading polls in Mexico is, and this is one of the neat things about these models, that uh, these shadows that you can see, it's the degree of uncertainty about the level of support for each of the main political parties. So you can see that the uh, larger uncert uncertainty levels, and you can see it here in these numbers, the uncertainty levels for the PRI goes from 19 to 31, that's 12 first percentage points. And for Morena goes from 21 to 35 
14 percentage points. What this means is that the polls right now, they are uh, di uh, having differences mainly in the measurement of the PRI and Morena. That's where you will find a lot of disparities, some polls that have Morena with big leads or some polls that have uh, the PRI with very good numbers. But it's not the case with the PAN and the PRD where the polling number seems to be more or less uh, stable with a degree of uncertainty which is normal for a polling measure. Uh, so to sum up this, uh, just keep in mind that we have a very good, uh, a high degree of uncertainty regarding uh, the electoral extent of the parties because we have a lot of undecideds, first. Second, uh, this is just the generic ballot. We now are going to see what the impact of the candidates are and we are going to see how this changes. Indeed, in these numbers, I don't present any measure about support for independent candidates because we still do not know if there's going to be one. At this moment, uh, the data that has been produced by the National Electoral Institute shows that even Margarita Zavala or El Bronco do not have or, or, or are not getting firms at the pace that they need to in order to gain registration, but they still have time. So this is another factor to keep in mind regarding the volatility that we are going to see with the polls in the near future. Now, going to the candidates. We've been talking about the parties. Now, let's talk about the candidates. This is name recognition. Do you know or have you heard about, and you can see very clear that Lopez Obrador is almost known by every living Mexican. 93% uh, of Mexicans have heard or know him. And then we have several people that want to be candidates that have about two thirds of name recognition among the Mexican public, Margarita Zavala, Miguel Angel Osorio, Miguel Angel Mancera, and Ricardo Anaya. But still it's uh, 25, uh, 20, 25 percentage point difference in terms of name recognition. And this is not going to change until there are official candidates. I mean, the campaign will make for most of these differences. But if you consider that the, at least in the case of the PRI, people are talking about that the candidates may be Jose Antonio Meade or Aurelio Nuno, they have even lower numbers of name recognition, about 30 percent of name recognition in the Mexican public. Uh, positive opinions among the candidates that are better known by the Mexican public, uh, it's, it's a reflection of name recognition. Uh, the one that gets uh, most positive opinions in Mexico in our latest survey, it's Lopez Obrador with 42% of positive opinions. If you consider that he has a 93% name recognition, uh, he more or less gets uh, about 45% of positive opinions among the people who know him. It's a very high ratio. In the case of Margarita Zavala, it's not even close to 40%, and Ricardo Anaya, it's more or less close to 30%. So even though candidates from other parties were to be as well known as Lopez Obrador, they still have to make up for, uh, for the ratio that Lopez Obrador has in terms of positive opinions regarding name recognition. So this is another thing to keep in mind that this is a very good ad, uh, advantage that Lopez Obrador has. He's very well known and among the people who knows him, there are a good number of citizens that have a good opinion about him because you can see in the percentage of positive opinions, Lopez Obrador with 42 and the closest uh, we have is Mancera and Zavala, 28, 25%. Uh, 
So it's a, it's a big difference, and obviously this will change during the campaign. Look, for instance, the case of El Bronco, there has been a decline in terms of positive opinions. It's a small decline, but he's not as well liked as he used to be among the Mexican public at the national level. And the other guys are more or less stable. Um, there, there is some instability regarding Ricardo Anaya, which has been the subject of a negative campaign during the past months, and obviously it shows in the polls. Head to head, um, the, the decision by Margarita Zavala about uh, one, six weeks ago to become an independent candidate, uh, basically she threw away our, all, our, all our time series regarding <laughs> head to head <laughs> because we were not considering her, so we don't have that much information. Um, so we have here three surveys that were conducted after the fact uh, that Margarita became an independent candidate. Ours is uh, it's our latest numbers. We will have new numbers in the next week, but I don't think that we will see uh, major changes. But once we put names to the parties, we can see that Lopez Obrador advantage, at least in our survey, which is the left-hand graph, it's a six-point advantage over the Frente, and I didn't talk that much about the Frente. I will get back to it in a moment. Uh, if you remember at the graph of partisan support that I showed you before, and let me go back, it's not that far. Look, if we have the Frente here, which are the percentage, let's look at these numbers, the support for the PAN, the PRD, and Movimiento Ciudadano, they get 38% of support. If the PRI makes an alliance with the Green Party and Nueva Alianza, it would have 32%, and Morena and PT, 29%. I mean, for the Frente Ciudadano, as it's called, obviously uh, an alliance makes a lot of sense because it will help help them to be very competitive in the campaign. But that's the numbers just with parties, without candidates. When we put candidates, and here's a reflection of the advantage that Lopez Obrador has uh, regarding all the other potential candidates, because Morena and PT, when they support Lopez Obrador, or when they nominate Lopez Obrador, they have the advantage, 28%. The Frente with Anaya, 22%, and the PRI with Osorio, 21%. Here it's very clear that as the potential candidates of the Frente or the PRI are not as better known as Lopez Obrador, people who support the Frente of the, or the PRI are not as cohesive regarding a candidate as the Morena voters are regarding Lopez Obrador. Once we, uh, this, uh, once there are official candidates for the front of the PRI, we should expect to see a closer alignment of support for the party and preference when we have candidates. But at this moment, we can see this divergence once you put the name of Lopez Obrador, the advantage that he has is more or less clear. The same thing happens with El Financiero. And uh, with Consulta Mitovsky, it's a closer race, uh, almost a statistical tie. Look that Margarita Zavala in the different measurements gets between seven and 12 percentage points. Uh, it has not been uh, a big blow to the to the pan. It seems that she has got support, especially among people who would like to vote for an independent, because the Bronco was much more popular when she was not running as independent. And nowadays, uh, he's appearing with very low numbers in the service. Um, but if it were the case that there were no independent 
in the presidential race, it is very likely that the numbers for the opposition parties will increase because usually an independent uh, citizen is somebody that does not have a positive opinion about the political establishment and of course the incumbent party is the most prominent figure of the establishment. So to sum up all the electoral scenarios, at this moment, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, the Frente Ciudadano, if it becomes a reality, will be a very competitive force. It needs to have a candidate that will uh, unite all the different forces behind uh, the candidate postulates the Frente. And this is not an easy task because you will have a Perredista that will have to support a panista candidate, for instance, and then you have Lopez Obrador on the other side. So for a Mexico City um, person, if he has to choose, uh, I mean, if he's a Perredista, but he has to choose between a candidate for the Frente that comes from the PAN or for Lopez Obrador, it's going to be a very interesting decision for that voter. Um, so th that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, Lopez Obrador, uh, the thing is that he's now probably at its best level. The question is that if he's going to be able to keep this level of support or we will see a decline in support for Lopez Obrador like we saw in 2006, which is some something that people talk about. But remember that in 2012, the past presidential election, Lopez Obrador started at a distant third place. Polls had him at the beginning of the campaign at 22%, and he finished with 32%. That is, he grew during the, during the campaign. 2006, he went down during the campaign. What happened this time is still uncertain. We, we will find out. Uh, just want to close, uh, how polarizes Mexico? We have a, I think it's a very neat question, which of the following do you think would be the worst scenario for Mexico? That the PRI wins the election or that Lopez Obrador wins the election? And we have 55% of people that say that the worst scenario is that the PRI wins the election and 32 that say that Lopez Obrador wins the election. Here, what it's important to keep in mind is that panistas and independents are divided. But even panistas are not that happy with the PRI repeating uh, uh, at the federal level. And this is probably related to the fact that President Peña is not very popular among priests. I didn't show the graph, but you have about 55% of priests that approve of President Peña's performance. It's a very, very low number. So uh, there are even priests that are not very happy about the PRI retaining the election. But this will be uh, probably a key thing to keep in mind if there is a strategic vote at the end of the campaign. Because for instance, if panistas perceive that uh, their candidate it, uh, has no chance of beating either Lopez Obrador or, uh, or the PRI, where they will go to. At this moment, we see that they seem to think that it's worse that the PRI wins the election than a victory of Lopez Obrador. And the same thing happens with independence, but independence is a key group here because it's more than half of the Mexican public. Uh, we did a statistical analysis to see how postures toward Lopez Obrador divide or polarize the Mexican public. And just look at the extremes. We have 23% that can be characterized as AMLO haters, and 27% of Mexicans who think that that can be characterized as AMLO lovers. So we see that 
almost half in half. Lopez Obrador polarizes a lot the Mexican public. And the key question here is that if this polarization about Lopez Obrador overlaps with policy polarization, especially regarding the reforms that President Peña put forward during this, his government. To give you an idea of the AMLO lovers, 99% of them have a good opinion about Lopez Obrador. Most of them vote Morena. Uh, 100 could vote Morena. 47% is independent and 28% perceive themselves as Morenistas. On the other hand, the AMLO haters, 76% have a bad opinion about Lopez Obrador. Most of them vote pre, and in second place they vote pan. 54% is independent, and 27 is priista. So the Mexican public is, is divided in that sense. But now going to the issue of reforms. I, I'm just going to mention education reform and energy reform, which I think are the two most uh, relevant for the Mexican public. And as you can see, education reform, especially during the past year, have had kind of mixed opinions, the same percentage of positive opinions and negative opinions. But nowadays, numbers have come back to levels seen about two, three years ago. It's this kind of bouncing back to previous levels. Uh, it's more or less a popular reform. 50% have a positive opinion about education reform, 28% a negative opinion about it. And energy reform, although numbers are not as bad as they used to be in the past measurements, it's a still a reform that has or that generates more negative opinions and positive opinions. At this moment, 41% of Mexicans have a negative opinion about energy reform. 29% have a positive opinion, which is similar to what we had about two years ago. The question is that if this opinion about these reforms overlap about, uh, with support for Lopez Obrador, that is, if people who are AMLO lovers reject all the, these type of reforms, and that people who hate Lopez Obrador, let's put it in those terms, are people who really like the reforms. And here we have, so the, the gap that you see between this and this is the gap between AMLO haters and AMLO lovers. And you can see that, as expected, people that we characterize as AMLO lovers are people who oppose the most the energy reform and the education reform. And those are the ones that give less support to those reforms. While people who are, or that we characterize as AMLO haters, are the people who oppose, uh, uh, who support the most uh, these reforms. But the gap is not very big. For instance, in education reform, we have that 45% of AMLO lovers support education reform, and about 56, 57% of AMLO haters support it. So the gap is not that big, which means that uh, still we don't have policy polarization. We have polarization regarding AMLO, polarization regarding a possible victory of the PRI, but we still do not see policy polarization where we would have, like here you have in the US, that people that are Democrat are in favor of the issues favored by Democrats in percentage around 90%, while Republicans are on the other side, gaps of 67%, 70 percentage points. Here, the gap is not that big. Probably the largest gap, about 25, percentage points is in energy reform. AMLO lovers, about 52% of them oppose the energy reform, while the, what we say, AMLO haters, only 26%, 27% oppose the energy reform. 
to conclude very quickly, the race is really close and there is a good chance it will continue to be very close. Uh, this is a fertile ground for negative campaign because minor changes in preferences will produce a different winner. So we should expect a very negative campaign in the months to come, especially if Lopez Obrador is still ahead, but no matter who is ahead, it's going to be, uh, I think, a very negative campaign. Uh, the cleavages that the structure electoral preferences right now are continuity versus change, pre, no pre, and postures toward Lopez Obrador, like it or dislike it. And at this moment, policy polarization has not overlapped with candidate polarization. But this is a question that we still, needs, uh, we still need to wait and see how it turns out because it can become an issue during the campaigns. Thank you very much. Jorge, that was excellent. Thank you so much. I'm going to take my privilege as, uh, as moderator to ask you uh, uh, an immediate question um, before we turn to the public, and that is uh, something which has obviously received a lot of uh, attention here in Washington um, uh, for obvious reasons, and that is the question of foreign interference in, uh, in Mexican elections. And I don't know whether you have uh, any idea of how aware Mexican voters are of the potential for foreign government interference in the Mexican electoral process. Um, we're all aware that Cambridge Analytica, one of the most controversial firms, has opened up offices in Mexico City. Um, and you hear various reports about whether they, who they want to work for. They say it's the, for the highest bidder. And, but then there are other reports that say, that, except we, we won't work for Morena. And they say, well, is that true? I don't know. So I wonder if you could just answer that uh, very quickly about you know, what is the awareness in Mexico amongst the public in general, the electorate, and also at the highest levels about the potential for foreign interference? Uh, well, in, in that sense, the Mexican public is not aware of that. And if they are even considering a foreign interfer interference, uh, I regret to say that they will think about the US government, not the Russian government. They will be thinking that if there is foreign interference, uh, it will come mostly from the US. Uh, regarding Cambridge Analytica, I mean, there have been several newspaper reports, but uh, this is not an, a household issue yet. Uh, it is possible, I mean, that uh, th there will be, as I was mentioning, ne negative campaigning is going to be uh, present in Mexico, and uh, I don't know if you saw the report by the Washington Post that w where they were presenting all the ads that were produced that were heavily segmented, addressed to very specific people, that it's a very good instrument for negative campaigning. And I think that all political parties are going to use uh, the social media to do negative campaigning. Uh, the question is that, uh, will there be other actors besides the main political parties that do it? Uh, probably it will, but, uh, because if you follow the, and this is just a speculation, but if you follow the nature of the foreign interference in the US process or Brexit, it seems that uh, in general, uh, the pattern that they follow is that they go against the establishment in terms of economic policy. So you would say that here you would want uh, a candidate to win that is going to chatter the establishment and that will create problems, for instance, in the relations with the US. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Uh, sorry, if you don't mind introducing yourself. The microphone is coming right here. Oh. Mm. Ask and it should be delivered. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm Dolly Esteri from Aquilente. Uh, just a quick question. Of course, uh, the Frente has not selected yet um, who's going to be their candidate, but I wonder if you can tell us whether, who, regardless of who the candidate is, Anaya or um, uh, Mancera or whatever, uh, do you think the Frente candidate will take away 
uh, votes from IAMLO, from Andres Lopez Obrador, or from the PRI? Uh, that's a very good, good question. I don't think that it will take voters from AMLO. I think that that's more or less the most cohesive uh, group. If you remember the segmentation I showed you, the AMLO lovers are, is a percentage of about 20 percentage points. Uh, yes, but they are not uh, AMLO voters at this moment. So uh, in terms of the electoral preferences right now, I don't think the, press, uh, the Frente will take it. Of course, it will take away potential voters from Lopez Obrador, but it may be the case also with the PRI. I think that uh, in general, uh, what the Frente may do is the, to change the narrative of the campaign, as I was mentioning, uh, and this is a major challenge for the Frente. If the main cleavages are pre versus not pre, AMLO versus no AMLO, where does the Frente position itself? And that's a key question, because we don't know what its argument is going to be. It doesn't have a narrative as attractive as pre no pre or AMLO no AMLO. So uh, that's, that's one thing. Obviously, a strong uh, Frente uh, will be an obstacle for Lopez Obrador to carry all the opposition support. No, I mean, if Lopez Obrador is, a, is the strongest opposition candidate and the Frente is very weak, it seems that all the voters that do not want the PRI uh, almost in a natural way would go to Lopez Obrador. And in that sense, a strong Frente is going to fragment the opposition. And that's an advantage for the for the PRI, but if you look at the, all the negative campaign against uh, Ricardo Anaya, it seems that at this moment the PRI doesn't seem that uh, to weaken uh, the Frente, it's a bad strategy. I still have no idea what they think that. I, I think that they are still thinking about what happened in 2006 or maybe the state of Mexico. I mean, the logic is this there is a certain kind of first round where the Lopez Obrador is going to advance to the second round because he's the strongest candidate, but then the question is, who is going to be the main alternative to Lopez Obrador? And at this moment, uh, it seems that the PRI is thinking that they have to defeat the PAN to become this alternative to Lopez Obrador, and they have uh, started a very negative campaign against uh, against the Frente and against Anaya. That's the logic. I don't, th I'm still not convinced because many of the supporters of the Frente are voters that by definition are opposition supporters. And I think at the end it will be most likely that they go for Lopez Obrador than for the PRI. But that's more or less the logic that they are applying. Uh, okay, so I have a question back here, gentleman with the glasses. Steve Landy, Manchester Trade. I'm sorry, I'm a few minutes late, and if you covered this already, just ignore it. But the way the people, the half of us who follow the NAFTA look at it, we're gonna have three, three possible outcomes before the election. One, an agreement in principle or something where people will come together. Two, a, break, a breakdown, which will not occur. And three, of course, just kind of suspending and uh, wandering through without really clearing what happens and we'll get back together again sometime in 2019. My question to you is two phrase. One, what we, if you have any one of those three results, or either one of them, what will be the result on the election? For example, if there is some kind of an agreement, will it help pre, not a big issue? And two, what will happen to NAFTA depending on which one of the three parties win the election? Thank you. Uh, I think that, uh, if, not, if NAFTA continues, I don't think it will help the PRI. It will be the status quo. I don't think there we, we will see many major changes uh, in, in that sense. The second thing is that um, if it becomes an, NAFTA it becomes an issue and uh, the candidates talk about, uh, recent numbers that we have produced, some of them have not been published, but we have about 60% of Mexico that would like Mexico 
of citizens that would like Mexico to continue being part of NAFTA. In that sense, we are not seeing also major differences between supporters of the different parties. And, uh, and I don't think that given the, the current state of uncertainty in Mexico regarding many issues, uh, especially the economy, that candidates, even Lopez Obrador, would like to introduce a major element of uncertainty. It would be kind of crazy that uh, Mexico continues or at the end reaches an agreement with the US and then you have Lopez Obrador winning the presidency and saying, oh, we don't want that. No, so I don't think that they will go uh, that far in that regard and hopefully it will not become an issue. There's no, there does not seem to be grounds for making an issue of the NAFTA, of NAFTA. Hi, uh, my name's Hattie Babbitt and I, have a, I wanna build a little on the last question. You chose in the uh, material you gave us at least to focus on the education reform and the energy reform. But as the preceding question pointed out, there are lots of other potential issues. It's not just NAFTA, it's internal security, there are big issues around the economy, there are big issues around corruption. Um, I, I'd like to understand a little bit better about why you didn't focus on the other issues, and if you did and didn't just reveal them to us, then what did you discover? Well, that's a very good question. The fact that I, I, I can send you later the data, I didn't uh, do it. The fact is that I think that uh, I don't, uh, more or less in the same sense that I answer. I don't think that uh, NAFTA will be a banner that major candidates will use during the campaign, while these kind of reforms will be an issue that they will use. Lopez Obrador has been very clear that energy reform uh, is something that he wants to change. And for instance, if Aurelio Nuno is the candidate of the PRI, I mean, he is the one behind the education reform, so it may become an issue. Uh, but you are right, I, uh, I didn't look at, at the other issues. I promise you I will send you with Duncan an updated version. What's the, uh, what's the position regarding NAFTA? Because I think that's a, a, a key thing to keep in mind. But at least the cross tabs, not with this segmentation, the AMLO lovers, AMLO haters, but in general just party ID, even Morena voters are more or less supportive of the NAFTA. I mean, minor differences, but it's not an issue right now that it's polarizing the Mexican public. Thank you. Uh, Peter, and then I've got a question right at the very back. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'm Peter Schechter. I, for a lot of part of my life, I, I consulted on political campaigns all around the world. I, I'm just struck, I wanna follow up on Hattie's question. I'm struck that corruption was not part of your presentation, and that the cleavages that you show there, corruption is not one of them. And and talk to us a little bit about how corruption and the um, impression of corruption is going to affect the race, particularly on the pre, but also how this could affect, in general, sort of the pox on all parties and the potential for an independent candidate. Uh, corruption is obviously is going to be an issue. Uh, but everybody is going to s go against corruption. I mean, it's not going to become an issue because like in the case of crime, everybody's going to say that they are going to end crime, that they are going to end corruption. You will not see, not even the PRI candidate saying that he's going to be tolerant towards corruption. So in that sense, it may not become an issue. It go it's going to become an issue because it's going to be a banner that all opposition parties are going to enarbolate. But it's very clear, I mean, uh, and in that sense, uh, you see a lot of consensus among the public that corruption is a major issue, that it's uh, sometimes it's a, with economy is the most important issue, even ahead of, uh, even ahead of uh, with crime. So, of course, and you're right, uh, it's an issue but I don't think that it's going to be an issue where you will find candidates that will take a soft approach to corruption, a soft approach to crime. Everybody is going to be condemning. Of course, corruption is already incorporated 
uh, behind the electoral preference of the Mexican public. Who perceives that uh, the Mexican government is corrupt? Percentages are higher among the supporters of the position and the PRI voters are a little bit uh, more uh, receptive to, to the government in that sense, but still the percentages are very high. So you don't find, you, you won't find a PRI voter that says that the PRI government is not corrupt or it's going to be very difficult. So the thing is, it, it go, it's going to be a, an issue. Certainly it will be, but uh, even though there are talks about how huge is corruption in this government, uh, the fact is that in previous government it has been an issue as well. And uh, it seems that Mexican voters uh, do not make uh, an issue of corruption because for them they cannot perceive major differences between the different parties. Lopez Obrador may be the one that gets the most credit in that regard, but still he's part of, the, of that political establishment that may, many Mexican voters reject. What I think is interesting, Peter, you, you draw the uh, sort of comparison with, the, well, there's a comparison to be drawn with the violent situation in Mexico. Everybody cares about it. Everybody thinks, you know, we've got to do something about it. And candidates have consistently failed to put forward real policies on it. And the only policy we have on fighting corruption so far has come from Andres Manuel, and his policy or his strategy is, I'll appoint honest politicians. You know, and it's like, wow, that's, that's extraordinary. Good luck in finding those guys. <laughs> on that note, uh, Francisco Alvarez um, here on my, on my own behalf. Uh, I wanted to, you know, as the political waters get roiled and as the political parties, the long standing political parties can no longer uh, take their traditional bases of support for granted, I'm wondering if you're anticipating a big push by the various candidates to reach out to, to new or different constituencies. Do you see them moving farther afield to reach out to uh, voters in maybe some of the other states outside of central Mexico and some of the industrial areas? Do you see them reaching out to uh, large expat communities abroad? Thank you. Uh, I don't think that they will reach expat communities abroad because it's very difficult to vote uh, for expats. Uh, if you are outside of Mexico. So the, the numbers of people who live abroad, of Mexicans who live abroad, who register to vote is very, very low. Uh, but they are trying to reach new constituencies, uh, which is not new, but uh, you know, uh, millennials are a fashion, so everybody's talking about reaching the millennial voter. Indeed, Mexico is a very young country. Uh, about 50% of the Mexican electorate uh, has 40, is 40 years old or younger. So you have a lot of voters there. And uh, the key question here is uh, how can you, how, how you can be attractive to them? And the thing is that uh, young, younger voters are more likely to be independent, that to reject the establishment, that to have negative opinions about the different parties. And uh, it will be a key battleground because because of their independent positions, these are the uh, voters that more easily changes uh, their electoral preferences. So I think that's where they are going to, to focus their efforts because as, the, as people grow older, they are more attached to parties, they are more likely to be people who vote for the same party. And also, they are also more likely to be recipients of uh, governmental aid. So it's a more stable vote. So the focus will be in the younger voters and especially in urban areas. We will see, as you saw here in the US as well, a different type of campaign that is going to be conducted in the social media. This is, this is something that we did not see 12 years ago. I mean, the segmentation that you are able to get now in social media is something that we did not have in, in, in the past. I have a final question from Ambassador Jones at the back. Thank you very much, a very good presentation. Uh, question is, does Mead uh, change the dynamics significantly? 
I think you said that his name recognition was only about 30%, which means his image can be molded uh, in a political campaign. If he's the PRI nominee, he has a reputation of being an independent until presently the, the current time. He's been in both a pawn and a pre-government. And I don't think there's been any hint of corruption of, of him personally. Does, so that gives someone who wants to really mold the, the candidate and, and the image of the candidate uh, a lot of canvas to work with. Would that significantly change the dynamics of the race if he were the pre-candidate versus AMLO? Yeah. You are absolutely correct. I mean, uh, Meath uh, has the advantage that uh, the fact that he's worked for both the, a PAN and a PRI government, uh, one big advantage, he seems not to be that close to President Peña, which uh, I think that right now, I didn't mention it, but I think that the Mexican public do not want somebody that resembles President Peña that close. And, and this is a drawback for uh, Miguel Angel Osorio or for Aurelio Nuño. Uh, so Meet doesn't have that problem. Uh, the fact, uh, and this is something to, to keep in mind, uh, things that in the past we thought that were handicaps now nowadays can be an advantage. Uh, one thing is name recognition, that he has a lot of recognition. Well, we can make a good uh, candidate out of him. But the other is that because of these anti-establishment attitudes among the Mexican public, somebody that is perceived not close to a political party is a very good thing. So uh, that's something that uh, Meath can build on. Uh, the key question is that if that is enough to overcome uh, the skepticism that or the rejection that Mexicans have regarding the PRI. Uh, I think that uh, perhaps Meath can be the more competitive candidate for the PRI, except in, uh, that there is one critical thing to keep in mind. He doesn't seem to be very good at campaigning. He may be very good at governing, but he doesn't seem to be a natural in that regard. And then you have a candidate with low name recognition that needs to be attractive to voters and that needs to reach new constituencies, that needs to reach uh, independence. And uh, that's a key question and, uh, and I don't have a clear answer for that. He doesn't seem to be that one. He may change, perhaps, but at this moment, and uh, he doesn't seem to be a, a good candidate he would be a very good candidate. But let's be honest, not, Os not Osorio, Narro, or Nuno doesn't seem to be natural ones as well. I'm sorry that we ran out of time today, ladies and gentlemen. I know you've uh, got a lot more questions, but uh, maybe Jorge can take a couple of questions uh, immediately after the event. Let me just say that uh, academic research from the, uh, at least the past three elections in Mexico suggests that the campaigns really do matter. And so tracking what happens throughout the campaign is gonna be critically important. And I'm delighted to, uh, th uh, to, uh, to let you know that of course we have a wonderful online resource, the Mexico Elections Blog, which is being uh, run by our associate Miguel Toro, who's actually just um, uh, authored a new piece today. So I urge you to go to that website and you can keep up to date with the uh, sort of latest uh, opinions and analysis on the Mexican election. Thank you, Jorge, for being with us today. Excellent presentation. Thank you for taking all the questions. And we hope to see you again here very soon. Thanks. Thank you.